Today on Categorical Imperatives, we are going to be discussing the landmark Supreme Court case of Gibbons v. Ogden. Hey, greetings, and welcome back once again to Categorical Imperatives. As always, I am Lockheed Liberal, and I want to thank you all so much for being here with me today. Uh, now, if you are new to this program, I want to welcome you. This is a podcast where we are going to be applying legal theory and moral philosophy to current events related to law, politics, and culture. Now, as I just alluded to a second ago, today we are going to be talking about the case of Gibbons versus Ogden. This case is also colloquially known as the Steamboat Case for reasons that will become perfectly apparent to you as soon as we get into it. Uh, this is the latest installment in uh, my absolute favorite series that I do here on the show, which probably has something to do with the fact that this is the only series I do on this show now that I think about it. Um, so, But anyways, what I call today in Supreme Court history. So we're just going to be uh, breaking down this historical case. And then uh, when we're done, I want to let you guys know right now uh, about a couple great resources uh, I have linked down in the description for this video. You, you actually got to go and check out after this if you find this particular episode and this topic interesting. First is uh, an article here. It is one that I wrote about this case for uh, the 10th Amendment Center. And uh, besides the fact that this article itself is great, if you read it and you get down to the bottom of it, uh, you're going to find a lot of other links to other articles by the 10th Amendment Center uh, about related topics, which in this case mostly means uh, different areas of the Commerce Clause. I, I think there's probably a couple other things that I've personally written down there too on uh, uh, Commerce Power in the New Deal era, uh, and the uh, progressive era, uh, but it, anything they have is going to be great material. So uh, absolutely go and check this article out. Follow the links down at the bottom of that article. Uh, tons of good information there. The other one uh, is the latest episode of the uh, Tenth Amendment Center's uh, podcast, Path to Liberty. Um, now, I assume that most people who uh, are watching my content already know all about the 10th Amendment Center and are already watching Path to Liberty because if you like what I do and you're unfamiliar with them, you really got to get your priorities straight because they are just fucking phenomenal. Um, but their most recent uh, episode was on the Gibbons versus Arkin case. Uh, and uh, they based this article, uh, this episode in part uh, off that article that I was just showing you that I wrote. Uh, but then they also uh, have some Really, really great uh, constitutional scholars who they also draw on uh, during that podcast episode. I, they have an article from uh, Randy Barnett. Uh, they got one from Rob Nadelson, uh, Kurt Lash. Uh, so, I, I mean, those are like three of the most stellar constitutional law scholars around today. So uh, you definitely got to go check that out. Uh, uh, just go give it a listen and then... Uh, head on over to the show notes page for that episode and there'll just be all kinds of uh, extra goodies and articles and stuff to link to. So uh, definitely go and check all of that out after you're done listening here. So the Commerce Clause uh, operates as both uh, a grant of power delegated to Congress and a constraint upon state legislation. Now, there is no clause in the 1787 Constitution that has been more disputed, and none has generated nearly as many cases. And in fact, to this day, uh, the extent over uh, how far the commerce power uh, extends really largely centers around the definitions of some key phrases, such as to regulate, commerce, and among the several states. Now, the original definition for all of these phrases uh, goes back to the earliest days of the Republic, uh, and in particular goes back to this case, Gibbons versus Ogden in 1824. 
So this case uh, began when this handsome gentleman here, uh, Aaron Ogden, was given a monopoly under New York law that allowed him and only him to operate his steamboats within New York waters. Now, another gentleman, Thomas Gibbons, disregarded the law, and he operated his own steamboats that traveled between New Jersey and New York. So Ogden sued to halt Gibbons' steamboat business because he contended that the New York law gave him a monopoly. Gibbons countered that the New York law interfered with a federal law that had licensed him to operate his ships. He said that if Congress had the power to license ships to travel between one state and another, then the New York law would be preempted and thus unconstitutional. However, uh, the New York court rejected Gibbons' constitutional argument and enjoined his operations. In turn, Gibbons appealed his case, eventually making it all the way up to the Supreme Court. Now, he argued that the uh, federal law uh, was supported by Congress's power under the Commerce Clause. Now, the Commerce Clause, found at Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3, says that Congress shall have the power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. However, Gibbons contended that a state cannot regulate interstate commerce. And in the end, in Gibbons v. Ogden, the Supreme Court agreed. So, Chief Justice John Marshall provided the court's first major interpretations of the words commerce and among in the Commerce Clause. Now, Ogden argued that the New York monopoly law was constitutional because Congress lacked the power to regulate boats traveling between New York and New Jersey. Commerce, he contended, was limited to, quote, traffic to buying and selling and the interchange of commodities and it did not comprehend navigation, end quote. Therefore, the New York law should control. However, as in the case of McCulloch versus Maryland, Chief Justice John Marshall rejected the narrowest interpretation of the congressional power in favor of a somewhat broader one. He went on to explain in his opinion that, Ogden's construction would restrict a general term, that is commerce, which is applicable to many objects, to one of its significations, meaning trade or traffic. Instead, Marshall adopted a broader interpretation of the meaning of the word commerce. He concluded that commerce undoubtedly is traffic, but it is something more. It is intercourse. It describes the commercial intercourse between nations and parts of nations in all its branches, and is regulated by prescribing rules for that intercourse. So, this conclusion is actually also supported uh, by evidence uh, that the original meaning of commerce included laws governing navigation. Next, Marshall explained that the word among in the Commerce Clause is defined as intermingled with. Marshall wrote that as comprehensive as the word among is, uh, it may very properly be restricted to that commerce which concerns more states than one. The word concerns is also another broadening term. So, when the words of the Commerce Clause in the Constitution are replaced by the synonyms used by John Marshall, where we replace commerce with intercourse and among with intermingled with, the power seems to be much broader, or at least that is how later courts would go on to rule. Now, the narrowest uh, definition of to regulate is to make regular. That is, to regulate the free flow of goods, but not except in cases of danger, to prohibit the flow of any good. Some scholars and a number of Supreme Court justices have supported that narrow definition, and in fact, in 1886, the House Judiciary Committee declared 
that a proposed bill that would have prohibited the sale of oleomargarine was against the original intent of the framers. The committee's reason was that the purpose of the Commerce Clause was to prevent state barriers to commerce, not to give Congress the power to do the same. Nonetheless, the Supreme Court never uh, formally accepted this limited view of what to regulate actually means. From the outset, in Gibbons v. Ogden, Chief Justice John Marshall saw the power to regulate as coextensive with others delegated with other delegated powers of Congress. He went on to declare, quote, this power, like all others, vested in Congress, is complete in itself. It may be exercised to its utmost extent and acknowledges no limitations other than are prescribed in the Constitution. End quote. So in other words, uh, to regulate is descriptive of the essential and core congressional power to legislate. The manner in which Congress decides to regulate commerce, Marshall said, is completely at the discretion of Congress. However, like in McCulloch v. Maryland, Marshall did place an important limiting principle on the scope of Congress's powers. The Commerce Clause enumerates three specific powers. It enumerates the right to regulate commerce first with foreign nations, second among the, the several states, and third with the Indian tribes. Therefore, we must uh, take it that that enumeration supposes something non-enumerated. So really, in other words, Congress can't regulate any type of commerce other than the three that are listed in the clause. Specifically, Marshall found that the Constitution does not give Congress the power to regulate uh, exclusively internal commerce of a state. Such exclusively internal commerce, he added, may be considered as reserved to the state itself. And this is where the text of the Tenth Amendment supports Marshall's conclusion. It provides that, the power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution, nor prohibited by it to the states, are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. If an enumerated power is not delegated to Congress, then it is reserved to the states. Now, with this broad reading of commerce and among, the courts found that Congress had the power to enact the federal law that licensed Gibbons' votes. As a result, the state law that limited boats from entering New York waters was preempted and thus unconstitutional. Like in McCulloch v. Maryland, Marshall can be accused of casually employing expansive and comparatively imprecise rhetoric concerning the scope of Congress's enumerated powers. But, once again, Marshall in fact reaffirmed limits on these powers. Uh, future decisions would rely on Marshall's broad definition of commerce and among, yet ignore his important limitation on federal power. All right, well, that's going to uh, do it for today. I want to thank everyone so much uh, for tuning in to Categorical Imperatives. Uh, as always, uh, if you like the show, uh, if you want to take a moment and uh, subscribe to the channel, uh, smash that like button. Both those things uh, absolutely help. Uh, if you have any comment, you know, uh, love, hate, criticism, praise, adulation, worship, um, I I'll accept any of it. Uh, feel free to let me know what you think in the comment section. And then uh, if you like this particular episode today, I just I ask people to uh, take a minute uh, and just think of one other person you know who you think might also like this episode, who might find this information interesting, uh, or someone who just kind of likes to learn about, uh, you know, law and history, or just anything like that. Uh, if you can help me grow the channel by just turning on uh, one new person uh, who you think might enjoy this information, I would be very grateful to you guys for that. So, uh, until next time, I, I have been Lockheed and Liberal. This has been Categorical Imperatives, talking about the Steamboat, Steamboat case. And 
As always, Dave Linda asked Carthago, 